Welcome to the Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm Kim Brown. Many enjoyed February's unseasonably warm weather across North America, but do these warm days in fact speak to the ominous issue of climate change as we sit on the precipice of drastic cuts to the EPA? And are the recent record-breaking temperatures in fact part of a larger pattern? We should note that Earth's 2016 surface temperature were the warmest temperatures since modern record-keeping began in 1880. This is according to independent analysis by NASA and NOAA the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. This makes 2016 the third year in a row to set a new record for global average surface temperature and continues a decades long-term warming trend. As well, the World Meteorological Organization announced Wednesday that Antarctica hit a new record high recorded temperature at 63 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. The Antarctic ice sheet contains 90% of the world's fresh water, which would raise sea levels by 200 feet if it were to melt. And to discuss these issues, we are joined by Dr. Alan Robach, who is a distinguished professor of climate science in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. His areas of expertise include geoengineering, climatic effects of nuclear war, effects on volcanic eruptions, and on climate. Also, he studies soil moisture. Welcome back to The Real News, Dr. Robach. I'm happy to be here. So firstly, can we tie in these record-breaking temperatures to a pattern consistent with climate change? As the globe warms, we would expect to have more record high temperatures and fewer record low temperatures. And so, yes, it's consistent. So is there a link between the heavy rains and snows that we're seeing in California and along the West Coast and the record high temperatures across the country, such as 80 degrees in Denver in February and several days of 70, day, 70 degree temperatures as well, plus an absence of snowstorms in Chicago, as well as uh, expectations that the cherry blossoms will bloom sooner than expected here on the East Coast? The warm temperatures that we're seeing in the central and eastern part of the country are of course consistent with out, with no snow and with earlier blossoming of the cherry blossoms and, uh, and other vegetation. And we typically see wave patterns in the atmosphere. So if the wind's from the south in one region, like where it's warm, it would be from the north in another region and the boundary between that would have storms. And so it's all consistent, it's all part of the atmosphere, yes. So it's not unusual to have no snow in Chicago and feet of snow in Oregon and in California. No, that is unusual to have no snow in Chicago. As I understand, it's the first time since we've been keeping records that there's been no snow in January and February in Chicago. And that's consistent with global warming. As, as the planet, let, let me simplify global warming for you in 10 words. It's real, it's us, it's bad, we're sure, and there's hope. And so uh, global warming is real. It's caused by the greenhouse gases that we continue to put in the atmosphere. And as the climate warms, there you'd expect there to be more record high temperatures. So the very warm temperatures we're having in the East Coast, however, are quite unusual compared to the rest of the world. There's other parts of the world right now where it's not particularly warm, but the average global warming, the first word in global warming is global, the average is going up. Dr. Robach, it's one thing to have warmth in the winter and many welcome it, but what are the concerns if it continues into summer? I mean, could this result in devastating heat waves, droughts, and wildfires? There's no way to connect the warmth we're having now with what's going to happen in the summer. There'll be lots of weather changes between now and then. So I think you're asking, in general, is global warming good or bad? Uh, what will be the impacts? And there will always be winters. Some people like it warmer, but uh, on the average around the world, there will be more losers. And so the main impacts we're, con we're concerned about are our effects on our food, on our ability to grow, grow crops, but also strong storms, sea level rise, and uh, droughts and flooding. And the, the frequency of all of those events is, is going up over time. So it's one thing to have 80 degree days in Denver. It's quite another to have 
mild temperatures in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So are we getting close to a tipping point in terms of setting off a climate change feedback loop that will be very hard to come from? After all, the Arctic posted recently a temperature of 63 and a half degrees in the middle of winter, which is, of course, somewhat unheard of. So what does the rise in temperatures in that region speak to the climate change effects to come? There have been some uh, warm air that's gotten up into the Arctic this winter and caused quite a bit of warming. And this is consistent with the gradual decrease of ice in the Arctic. Every winter, we still have ice. But in the summer, in September, which is the month for the lowest ice, the amount's been going down and down uh, episodically, but there's a trend downward. So it's all consistent. But I don't think we should talk about tipping points. The system is more gradual than that. A tipping point implies that once we get to that, uh, we can't recover. And that's not the situation. Every summer, we get very little uh, sea ice, but in the winter, it grows back. It, it freezes as it gets cold in the winter. So even if we have no sea ice in the summer, we'll still have sea ice in the winter. If we stop putting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And if we can uh, take the carbon dioxide out, then the climate will, will cool back down again and, and we'll go back to where we were. So it's, it's not irreversible. It, it may not be irreversible, doctor, but it took us several generations to get to this point. So I would assume it would take us several generations to get, a, get us out of this point. But human behavior doesn't seem to be changing all of that much in order to take carbon and methane and these greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere in order, for example, for sea ice to, to regain its strength, as it were, in the Arctic during the winter months. So, I mean, what type of time frame are we looking at here? Because we would have to start doing everything correct today in order for it to be restored to what it was pre-industrial times. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's a question of how humans behave and what choices we make in terms of how we live our lives and how we get our energy. So the technology exists today to get energy from the sun and from the wind, use electricity, and not use the atmosphere as a sewer to dump our carbon dioxide with no fee. To change that system, you would have to have strong political decisions around the world and you'd have to have companies that are making a lot of money from continuing business as usual to change their tune and to get on board. The Paris Agreement a, a year and a half ago was a good step in the right direction where all the countries agreed to limit their, to reduce their increases of emissions and limit their emissions in the future. But there's no police of carbon, there's nothing to enforce these commitments. And so we need continued political will to move in that direction. Mm, the, the, the only way to do it economically, I think, uh, more rapidly is a gradually increasing carbon tax or carbon fee, where you pay for your pollution. You know, if somebody comes and takes your garbage, or if you uh, use your toilet, you got to pay somebody for that. But we don't pay anybody for dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A gradually increasing fee that would be returned to the people uh, would go a long way to incentivize many ways to use energy without dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. On top of that, the price of solar panels is really plummeting the price of wind power is going down. So there are economic reasons why this is happening anyway. The United States emissions of carbon dioxide have been going down for the last decade, even though our economy has been increasing. But political action would make it go much more quickly. Indeed. We have been speaking with Dr. Alan Robcock. Sorry. We have been speaking with Dr. Alan Robach, who is a distinguished professor of climate science at the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. Doctor, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.